the Grocky brothers were wealthy tycoons, basically make Rome great again. The Optimates Deep State. What? Wait, hold on, what? Have you heard of crypto? Of course you have. The ways I hone my predictive abilities is to <laughs> look backwards over. As I explain here in this text wall. <laughs> He is doing the chart again. It's so good. <laughs> what the fuck? I'm so sorry. I'm sorry for peeking the mic. War Thunder is a vehicle combat game on PC and console, sporting over 2,500 tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships from 10 major nations, all the way from the interwar years to the modern jet fighters and main battle tanks being used today. The game sports highly detailed and realistic graphics and sound effects that bring to life the most powerful war machines of our time. War Thunder is really cool because of how the game approaches its damage simulation, with individual parts and their purposes modeled. If you take a shot, it then has to penetrate your armor, and if it does, it might hit vital parts, disabling them. This creates a dynamic, stressful, and memorable situation situations, like landing your plane back at base with half a wing, or watching that guy who packed too much ammo go up in flames because your tank shell hit the 30 shells stored in the side of his tank. Radar systems, targeting systems, shells, missiles, armor types, and more are simulated with impressive detail. My favorite part, however, is how War Thunder not only is a fun game, but also functions somewhat like a digital museum. What War Thunder provides, for free no less, is the ability to observe these things from the convenience of your own home and connect with these machines from history in a way pictures and words on a page might not. Join a community of over 70 million players in PvP battles today and dive into War Thunder with an unmatched wealth of high-quality content to discover. There is simply no game better suited for those interested in the war machines of the 20th century and beyond. Play War Thunder for free on PC, PlayStation, or Xbox by clicking the link in the pinned comment or in the description of the video. New and returning players that haven't played in six months also get a bonus pack that includes premium vehicles, an exclusive decoration, 100,000 silver lines, and seven days of premium. Bear in mind this is available for a limited time only, so click the link below. In 2022, someone in my Discord posted What About His second US Civil War video, and begged me to react to it. I watched about half a minute of it on the bus, went home, and did a quick live recording, intending the video for my tiny audience. That video now has almost 600,000 views, and most definitely left its target audience. What About His released another video just like it, updated for 2024. And just like the last one, I recorded myself watching it, and my reactions, and I've edited that down and added context, sources, and commentary in post where necessary. If you don't know who was of Altist is, I've made a couple of videos on his takes on left-wing politics and his approach to history that you can watch. I'll link them in the description down below. Or on the side if YouTube decides to change the layout again. Hitler was LARPing conquering Eastern Europe. The communists were LARPing- Wait. Huh? Wait, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Hold on. LARPing turns real. Hitler was LARPing okay. conquering Eastern Europe. The communists were LARPing revolution and the American South was LARPing secession. It's all fun and games until the Nerf guns get replaced for AR-15s. Okay, no, but the, I, he's not entirely wrong in, in in this. It's just that his examples are dog shit. LARPing will become real at some point in a lot of these situations. But not in the sense that, like, you know, no, Lenin was not LARPing. Not in the sense that a bunch of fucking uh, dudes who can't run for two minutes without having to stop in, like, undersized plate carriers and stuff. Uh, LARPing with their, like, you know, white balaclavas or whatever the fuck they wear. Like those, uh, the Patriot Front guys or whatever the fuck. Those guys LARPing is not going to turn into a rev revolution. Um, but it is going to turn real in the sense that people are going to get hurt. So, like, LARP can get people hurt, and LARP often gets people hurt. What's LARPing? Live-action role-playing. It's uh, associated with a nerds going into the woods, dressing up as elves and orcs and stuff. In a sense, like, if you do, like, military simulation with airsoft, that's kind of LARPing. Yeah, Vampire the Masquerade LARP, which is just, yeah, having sex with people. <laughs> Don't go to one of those expecting that, though, please. Be normal. The scary thing now is that there have been a series of horrifying events that only make sense in a context yes. of a society that's about to have a civil war. The most recent example is... Sorry, that was me saying yes to Bobbert about uh, historical reenactment is kind of LARPing as well, yeah. Texas saying the federal government has abandoned duties to the nation by letting millions of immigrants cross the Mexican border, and Texas won't take it anymore. Now half the states in the country have supported Texas, and 10 have offered to send troops to help protect Texas. Maine and Colorado tried to take Trump off the ballot, and New Mexico tried to ban guns. So that situation was silly because, like, that was literally about, what, um, a kilometer of, uh, of razor wire? It's all posturing. It's all, like, election campaigning. And I guess, like, the Biden campaign decided that they have nothing to gain from, like, from escalating, so they just kind of, like, they buried it, knowing that it was just posturing from, you know, Greg Abbott and all of them, trying to create, like, an election situation. Biden backed down on this and brushed the whole situation under the rug. There's a reason we haven't been hearing much about it. It's a big political PR stunt, one that could have ended in lawsuits and court cases, and still might. 
the implication of the Supreme Court ruling on the Texas border is literally just that federal agents are allowed to cut the razor wire that the Texas National Guard are setting up, which the Texas National Guard are free to continue setting up. So it's just a very wasteful and silly piece of theater. Someone comes in to set up the wire, someone comes in to remove it. The Supreme Court ruled that Trump will be allowed on the Colorado ballot as well, which was completely expected considering the makeup of the Supreme Court. These people are career politicians. They're very careful about managing the stakes of these situations, and a lot of it is just for show. LARPing, if you will. But what if Altist was right in that LARPing can and will still get people hurt? It's happening at a much smaller scale than what you're imagining, but it's still very much real harm. Focus should be on dealing with this harm that's happening now, not the harm you're fantasizing about in some hypothetical civil war. A lot of people are being thrown under the bus for political theater. Whether it's done by a rich senator who has never set foot in a public bathroom, but is choosing to target trans people because someone is arguing for unisex bathrooms. Or it's done by some jackass with a camera at the border, interviewing undocumented immigrants the moment they arrive in the United States, just to grab some extra clicks. These are all things in which the only previous precedent in our nation's history was the last civil war. The last time states bucked the central government in this manner, or states took candidates from the main opposition party off their ballot, was 1860. I tried to look up the ballot thing, but I don't actually know if opposition candidates were struck from ballots by states preceding or during the Civil War. There have been claims about this happening to Lincoln, many circulated in recent times comparing Lincoln to Trump, but this didn't happen. Elections just worked differently back then, with Republican tickets just not being distributed in some places because the Republicans didn't campaign there, so voters had to write in their candidates, as Dr. Christian McWerther of the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum states in this article. There weren't necessarily ballots, there were party tickets, and you got them from the newspaper, in the mail, from campaigners, and so on. And in some places, you literally just told the clerk who you were voting for out loud. Elections in the United States, especially local ones, were a mess in the past. In 1916, Mingo County Circuit Court Judge James Dameron declared that it was his primary objective to clean up the voter registration rolls by, quote, striking from the list illegal voters, dead men, mules, and tombstones. There's a newspaper article and oral testimony that does allege that a mule did vote in a past election in his district. I'll tell you more about this stuff when I eventually get around to finishing my videos on the Cold Wars and the Battle of Blair Mountain. The last time states bucked the central government in this manner, at least to my recollection, was in Arkansas in 1957. Though I'm sure it's happened again after that, but this one is the best example I can think of. In Brown v. Board of Education, the Supreme Court ruled that racial segregation of schools violated the 14th Amendment. In response, Arkansas Governor Orville Eugene Faubus mustered 270 members of the Arkansas National Guard to block nine black students from entering the Little Rock Central High School on the second day of school. Because of the increasing belligerence of both white protesters and the Arkansas state government, President Eisenhower sent the 101st Airborne Division to enforce the Supreme Court's ruling. What if Altist continues to forget that the civil rights movement happened? What you're about to hear is from a video from 2022. All of this is so shocking when you put it into perspective that in living memory, or back in the 40s and 50s, political polarization was basically absent from America. Bro, in the 40s and 50s, black people did not have equal rights to white people. What are you talking about? What? Wait, hold on, what? Have you heard of crypto? Of course you have. More specifically, have you heard of the usual problems in crypto? Shadowy <laughs> agents who are trying their hardest to steal honest people. Oh, he's, he's advertising a crypto exchange. No, oh, these are all scams, dude. Crypto exchanges are all scams. Yeah, it's a crypto ad, ad read, but these are all scams. Like, all, all the exchanges are shady as fuck yeah no he hates um he hates uh a specific he, he hates higher education and it's got something to do with like him buying into these ideas of um of like higher education being captured by the left yes this is more or less the same shit he said in the old one yeah i do think that he kind of just revised the script because um the texas border thing was in the in the news yeah frankfurt school coming up any moment Defund the police. The left supports replacing non-college educated policemen with college educated social workers. In what sense is this bad? <laughs> like, come on, man. They don't have to be college educated social workers. They just have to be educated social workers. Don't like half of cops go to college, though? I don't think so in the US. In, in Norway, you need a bachelor's degree to be a cop. Foreign policy. The left prefers using college educated diplomats for international affairs and wars. <laughs> yeah, we, we love using diplomats for wars. While the right prefers using non-college educated military for, for international why would you put a fucking general in charge of diplomatic affairs? That seems like a terrible idea. Yes, generals are also highly educated. I mean, I don't know what he like he means by this. Is he saying like send out a private dumbfuck from I don't know Boise, 
Idaho to, <laughs> to negotiate uh, peace in the Middle East. Like, isn't the lowest rank you can, or highest rank you can ex- attain without a college degree something like a sergeant? Because you have to be a commissioned officer, and doesn't that require a college degree to be higher than that, to be like a, a lieutenant or something? I'm not a military dude, so I never served, quote unquote served college educated left versus non-college educated right. As I explain here in this text wall, every single policy the left pushes benefits the college educated, giving them jobs and power. Meanwhile, the opposite is true for the right, which stands for- Yeah, like not criminalizing homeless people um, benefits college workers or college educated workers. I would highly recommend the book Leviathan and Its Enemies by Samuel Francis. It's one of the best political books I've ever read, where Francis was a conservative who in this book was doing a Marxist class analysis of modern society. (laughs) Holy shit! I need to read this. The first thing I do when I look at a book that I'm unfamiliar with is to look for reviews by trusted scholars who have had more time than me to delve into its contents, so as to prepare myself a little bit and ease the workload. The closest that I could find was a review hosted on countercurrents.com. The review's footnotes seem to be broken and instead linked to an overview of its articles, like this one, quote, The Jewish Question Going Mainstream Before Race Realism, A Good or a Bad Thing? Anyhow, from my brief reading, this does not seem like a Marxist analysis, but it does seem like a materialist analysis, or at least something dressed up in class or materialist analysis. What Samuel Francis argues is that capitalism is dematerializing private property and shifting the base of power from lying in ownership of property towards skills and management, and the idea that such a regime perpetuates itself. There's also a lot of polemics against what Sam Francis views as the fake right or not the real right. Samuel Francis owed much of his intellectual debt to a man named James Burnham, who was a Marxist turned conservative. Sam Francis himself was not a Marxist. Sam Francis, in fact, was a noted white supremacist. According to Leonard Zeskind, quote, the most proximate cause of Francis's fall from conservative grace was a column he wrote attacking a Southern Baptist Conventionist declaration that slavery had been a sin from which it asked forgiveness. Quoting further, In his defense, he argued, the Apostle Paul had spoken in favor of servants obeying their masters. Only with the Enlightenment, he wrote, did a bastardized version of Christian ethics condemn slavery, and the poison of equality seep into the tissues of the West. Then it got worse after Dinesh D'Souza quoted him from an American Renaissance conference. Here, quoting from the Washington Post, Francis said at a conference that his fellow whites must, quote, reassert our identity and our solidarity, and we must do so in explicitly racial terms through the articulation of racial consciousness as whites. The civilization that we as whites created in Europe and America could not have developed apart from the genetic endowments of the creating people. After this, he was told to resign from the Washington Times. After his death, white supremacist Jared Taylor and founder of the American Renaissance Conference eulogized him in the following manner. Quote, Samuel Todd Francis was the premier philosopher of white racial consciousness of our time. No one did more to alert whites to the crisis they face, and no one called them more eloquently to action. The ways I hone my predictive abilities is to look <laughs> backwards over... So I just probably peeked the fuck out of the mic, I'm so sorry. You know, one of the ways I hone my predictive abilities. Fucking Paula Trade is in here. <laughs> what the fuck? I'm so sorry. I'm sorry for peeking the mic. Uh, This book was written in the 60s, about 2011. This is what it predicted. America's first black president named Obomi. (laughs) What the fuck? What? It predicted video calls. Bro, that's because 2001 A Space Odyssey had video calls. Also, books before then had video calls. It's sci-fi. Barack Hussein Obomi. (laughs) Predicted gay marriage, Viagra. Who could have predicted gay marriage in in the 1960s? Bold prediction. Tech megacorporations. Yes, that's like cyberpunk uh, literature was fucking booming. Continued racial tensions. Wow, who who in the 1960s could have predicted racial tensions in the United States of America? <laughs> Detroit collapsing. Yeah, Detroit still exists, I think. Genetic engineering. Okay, man. Like that that was like pretty much a thing already, wasn't it? Electric cars also like not legalization of weed. None of this is like insane. Yeah, book in the 1960s depicting legalizing weed and also racial tensions. Holy shit. Obomi is fucking insane. That's so fucking funny. (laughs) I mean, that's not Obama's name, obviously. And I guess like, you know, a black president, of course, but I feel like that's also not a bold prediction to make in the United States of America. Like that would happen eventually. 
Yeah, this is so fucking funny. I love this slide. This is amazing. I do wonder how much of this is on a purely intuitive level that we don't understand. Like, there was a book a hundred years ago that said the Lord of Mars would be called the Ilona. Why does he keep doing these images with, like, no, like, nothing behind it? All, all you had to do was slap a background on this, drop a drop shadow on this, and it pops way more. True, yeah, Chad move. I guess you're right. This is a Chad move. <laughs> Just a bunch of images with, like, black backgrounds. Uh, nothing going on. To be fair, it is a Chad move, you're right. <laughs> he, he is doing the chart again, it's so good. Oh man, we're we're so back. This is so sick, I love this. The deep state, of course, yeah, that's true. We got the deep state, that's true. My correct and incorrect predictions so far. Correct, predicting the invasion of Ukraine to the exact week. I need to see a source on this. Ethiopia's civil war, that's brave. Uh, the rise of the new right, brave. China turning Maoist, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> Did I miss something? Yeah, Maoism with Chinese characteristics. Wokeness spiraling into further craziness in 2021. That's so fucking funny to put on your correct predictions. Um, he was he was scraping the barrel for this one. Europe cutting off immigration. Um, that has not happened. What are you talking about? When did this happen? <laughs> Where is he getting his news from? The collapse of the liberals in Canada. That's an oddly specific thing compared to like most of these things. Incorrect. A famine in the third world. Um. H haven't there been several? Isn't he wrong about him being incorrect? I have a solid amount of correct and incorrect predictions under my belt. Keep in mind, I'm a 22-year-old with no credentials. Listen to me at your own risk. The way the future- No! Oh, that's good of him to say that, though. This is why I've told the right repeatedly to not rebel out of the blue. The left's greatest trick is baiting the right into hazard. <laughs> Come on, man. Any sort of insurrection or rebellion out of the blue, of course, is going to not work because that's not how successful um, revolutions occur. The left psychology is female and the rights is male. This shit again. Men will do low-level aggression much more than men. They lie more, spread more rumors, insult more, and nonviolent action. Men tend to go- It's so weird. Go from 1 to 10 in that guys are either friends or they're beating the crap out of each other. I think the left is- That's not true. Men are the exact same way sometimes. Have you- Fuck it. You have a Twitter account. You know how it is. People are passive aggressive and shit all the time. People like talk behind each other's backs. It's effectively a wife begging her husband to beat her again and again so that when he actually does do so, she can take him to court as an abuser. The sad thing is- Insane analogy. You did not have to use that analogy at all. That in our society, she can just say that he beat her without any evidence in the court will- Oh my god, it's the fucking same shit Tick said about like the courts being <laughs> controlled by the left and uh, corrupt because I don't know, fucking family law. I know a couple of people that happened to. We all- Of course you do, because you hang out with white libertarians and they're all divorced or they are sex offenders. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I shouldn't say shit like that. <laughs> Lots of death happens in civil wars, and people hate the other side. Think of all the Jews in Poland. Oh my god. In 1939, who considered fleeing, then thought of how all their family, work, and friends were there. They then died at Auschwitz. A great failing of our society is that we need a spreadsheet or scientific study to say what's obvious to anyone with a supple mind. Guys, what's a supple mind? It's obvious women are more emotional than men. I communicate with women differently due to that. It's obvious that America is a better country in Mexico. Okay, so his point is that in my heart of hearts, in, in the root of my existence, I feel that uh, women are different to me, and therefore I must treat them as aliens. And buck all empirical evidence that says otherwise. I mean, this is literally vibes-based politics. That if you just look outside, it's obvious to me that we're about to have a civil war. Yeah, li literally, like, he he's saying, yeah, no, uh, trust your instincts. Don't trust empiricism. Trust your instincts. Trust your vibes. Like, he he's appealing to, to, uh, to your preconceived notions, because you see this, of course, right? Like, you can tell this is true. This is kind of cringe, since the worst people say this, but I think I might be an empath. I can't <laughs> help but pick up on the emotions of the people around me. Except if they're women. City. When I speak before a crowd, I feel that it has an energy that I can almost play like a musician. The thing is that the what? vibes today are absolutely horrible. Far worse. <laughs> He's correct. Vibes. The vibes are fucked. <laughs> He's absolutely correct. Worse than they have been at any previous point in my life. I've stopped going to major cities anymore since the vibes are just too bad. It oh feels shit! This is the stuff he was tweeting about like two days ago. Like no, not even a, a day ago. How fast does he make these videos? 
he must have made this in a single day because like a lot of this stuff is shit he was talking about like a day ago or two days ago. I have two friends who are professional experts in body language and language usage. They say that the language and actions now show that we will have a civil war soon. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? This is incredible. I, I This might be his magnum opus. I say this every video that I watch of this, like this might be his best one so, so far. This is AI generated. This is an AI generated picture. We're getting to the point where a large part of the population needs a civil war so they don't kill themselves. Author- What? One of the things you hear about pretty often in history books, so much so that it's become almost a trope, is that when the revolution starts, the elite has no comprehension that it could possibly occur. I often hear stories of the Chinese emperor locked in his palace, secluded among eunuchs, bureaucrats, and harem girls, only realizing the empire is doomed as Mongols or rebels scale the walls. Growing up, I thought we were better than that, but we're not. What about his doesn't cite specific historic examples, but is instead describing a literary trope, not necessarily a recurring fact of history. This trope was purposefully designed to paint the old ruling caste as disconnected from reality and from the concerns of the people, so to say. This trope is, of course, rooted in some genuine human experiences throughout history, but fundamentally exists to pass judgment on a past regime. An example is Marie Antoinette allegedly confronted with the fact that the population was starving and saying, let them eat cake. Or more specifically, she said brioche, but it communicates the same sentiment. She never said this. The quote was written by Rousseau two decades prior to the French Revolution, and popularized half a century after the revolution. This general sentiment can be found in lots of stories from cultures all over the world. It's a very common literary trope that speaks less to the reality of the situation as it was, and more to the experience of living through class conflict in various periods of history. Class conflict never went away, and you and I have both witnessed many let them eat cake moments from privileged people detached from how we live our lives. That's why the trope has endured. It's relatable. Virtually all revolutionary situations are preceded by periods of revolt and increasing tensions, foretelling the possibility of an escalation. If 22-year-old Wartwald Hiss can see it coming, then so can the elites with all the resources at their disposal. Historically, the two major determinants for whether or not a revolution is realistic are discontent with the regime, whatever it may be, and the ability of the regime to exercise authority over the populace. There has to be a will to overthrow the regime, and an inability to prevent that overthrow. When those two factors intersect, a revolution becomes possible. Whatever form the regime takes, it is well aware of this and maintains institutions for internal security that maintain authority and control. Now, of course, I might be taking what about this a little bit too seriously here because he follows this up with... Over the last year, I've seen the rise in what I call normie mindset. For older people, <laughs> the term normie is what young people call people who are too normal. This is a group of people who reject that we will ever have a civil war, that it's just not going to happen. Look at these photos of Berlin, Paris, and Russia before their political insanities. Does this look like a society which is about to commit one of the worst atrocities ever? Absolutely That's yes. the problem with modernity. Absolutely yes. We have no conception of what human nature really is. Yeah, look at these idealist uh, photos of empires. Does this look like a society that's going to do something really bad? <laughs> I don't know. Gen Z is 90% less spending power than their parents. At least 70% of 21-year-old men are virgins. The ruling class doesn't care enough about the young to even acknowledge this, let alone do something about it. Any discussion of economic opportunity and material factors by Wood Vault Hist must be accompanied by talking about young men's opportunity for sex. What do you want the ruling class to do about men not having sex, Rudyard? What characterizes the ruling class in our present society? What class interests are most often furthered and represented in the politics of our respective countries? And what class do those who are not a part of the ruling class belong to? He's leaving a lot of stuff unexplained and open for broad interpretation. It might be that he's cynically playing all the talking points, but let's actually engage him on a topic that very often gets reframed in an unproductive way by right-wingers. According to Pew Research, Generation Z encompasses people born from 1997 to 2012. I was born in 1995, so I'm talking about a generation that I do not belong to. However, I think I can relate a little bit more to some of the economic woes of Gen Z than someone who gets crypto exchange ads, which, from what I can understand, pay out several thousand dollars. Many in Gen Z in the United States in particular are working multiple jobs to make ends meet, and a high proportion in Gen Z than in the rest of the population report that they do not make a livable wage. But that's 26% in Gen Z versus 20% of the general population. My point is that things are really bad for everyone who can count themselves among the so-called reserve army of labor. The reserve army of labor is a body of the population that grows or contracts. It is mobilized or disbanded depending on the needs of capital. One function of the reserve army of labor is to depress wages, as people who are outside of stable employment and desperate for any sort of work will take that work on unfavorable terms. 
The gig economy and services like Uber and DoorDash benefit greatly from this perpetually underemployed population needing extra work to make ends meet. A report by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York considers 33% of college graduates underemployed because they're working jobs that do not require a college degree. Essentially, these are people who are qualified to work more specialized jobs, but under the present economic situation are forced into lower-paying jobs. Minimum wage, the wage earned mostly by young workers entering the labor market, has not kept pace with the cost of living in the United States since 1968. But labor productivity in the United States has increased over the past 10 years, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Quoting a little-known man by the name of Karl Marx, The overwork of the employed part of the working class swells the ranks of its reserve while conversely the greater pressure that the reserve by its competition exerts on the employed workers forces them to submit to overwork and subjects them to the dictates of capital. The condemnation of one part of the working class to enforced idleness by the overwork of the other part, and vice versa, becomes a means of enriching the individual capitalists. A case study examining the youth labor force in the Illawarra region of Australia found that the region was dominated by persistently high youth unemployment rates as well as dominant cyclical activity, which dominant neoclassical economic theory did not adequately explain. What they found was that the youth fairly frequently flowed in and out of employment and the labor force, consistent with the depiction of the Illawarra youth labor market as one of a surplus reserve army of labor that is mobilized and demobilized per the needs of capital. Moving on to the silly part about sex. What if Altis says elites are reluctant to do anything about the fact that quote, 90% of 21-year-old men are virgins? He doesn't cite the statistic, and I find the 90% figure somewhat hard to believe. He also doesn't propose any solutions to the perceived problem, beyond some aimless revolt against the present state of things, which is common among people who talk about this on the right. There have been those on the right who, when confronted with the invisible hand of the quote, sexual market not really favoring them, have begun to argue for a planned sexual economy. Proposals range from state-regulated monogamy to handmade stale type situations. This is obviously not a good solution to what people describe as, quote, involuntary celibacy. What Voltist goes into detail on this issue in his Incel Revolution video, which was released as I was wrapping up this video, so I'll only talk about that video in brief. If you'd like to see a full response to that video, let me know in the comments. In the beginning of that video, he shows the following slide, and talks about how the left operates devoid of evidence and logic. He appeals to, quote, biology to debunk, quote, gender relativism. I, of course, sometimes do reference biology and evolutionary biology at that. In fact, in the past, I've referenced the same evolutionary biologist as he has in order to disprove his own point. The point what Valtes was making then was similar to what he's saying now. He was appealing to a biological baseline that overrides human social constructions making the, quote, biological thing more, quote, natural than the social construct. There is no rational way to separate what is natural and unnatural about human social relations. Our capacity to create complex social constructs is an inherent part of what makes us human. It's a defining characteristic of our species. As such, gender roles do change, and the very nature of gender as reflected in our society may change, as it has throughout history before. Here's me on the 20th of June 2023 quoting from a book what of all tests just praised. The evolutionary logic in itself has no normative implications. It can inform us about human natural predispositions, the often ignored effects of which we would be wise to take into account, but which are often variable and even contradictory. We may choose to follow such predispositions or rebel against them. There is nothing sacred or morally compelling about maximizing the survival for the fittest. This is merely the blind algorithmic mechanism of natural quote-unquote design. The human brain, itself a product of evolution and a powerful instrument of conscious, purposeful, and future-oriented rather than blind design, may come up with more satisfactory arrangements. Darwinism may thus be regarded as our key to understanding nature, but as mostly irrelevant for understanding human society shaped by culture. I think there is a real problem here, but it's grotesquely misdiagnosed. What if autists and others tend to hyperfixate on the sexual part of this, instead of, in my opinion, the far more important aspect of general loneliness? These people aren't having sex because they're not forming meaningful relationships. I don't think I should have to pull up statistics to convince people that a lot of sex, perhaps the majority, happens in lasting relationships. Let's say you compare someone who has 21 night stands in one year and someone who's in a committed relationship. Odds are, the person who's in a committed relationship probably has more sex, the other one just has more sexual partners. There are lots of factors that play into this. Some of them do come down to personal responsibility, but others are socioeconomic. Money is not a requirement to have a meaningful social life, but much of our way of socializing is tied up with consumption. It's hard to quote Netflix and chill without a Netflix subscription. And you're not going on dates if you have no free time because you're working a second job to make rent this month. Dating itself is even commodified through paid services like apps. It's capitalism all the way down. Right-wingers will bring up changing gender dynamics as an element fueling male loneliness and depression. But frankly, this goes against our empirical data on the subject. In fact, higher gender equality actually correlates to higher happiness among men. More empowered women correlates to lower depression among men. 
Our gender equality also correlates to more sexual activity. Those who experience harsher economic constraints, i.e. poverty, also exhibit fewer signs of sexual flourishing. The risk of depression among men is also lower in populations with lower income inequality. What if altists and others who argue for right-wing solutions to this perceived problem by encouraging gender inequality and economic inequality, and so on, are actually making things directly worse? The thing here is that I've been yeah. researching this video and there's so much misinformation for this. How long have you been researching this video? Please tell me. It just doesn't add up. I have a friend who's a professional statistician and he was saying the standard of living has remained constant since COVID. And I said, that's insane. There's no way that can be true. I think there's ways that could be true, but you can look at a graph of the consumer price index and see that's been steadily increasing pretty aggressively. The purchasing power of the US consumer dollar has also steadily decreased. There are other more nuanced metrics to be utilized here that clearly illustrate that in some ways things are worse, and historically things haven't really been getting better for the working class. Something I've spoken about in previous videos, and especially this one, is the incredible similarities between the Roman and American empires. And if you want to look at the cycle of civilizations, the era which corresponds to us is the fall of the Roman Republic around 100 BC. Please mark the square labeled Oswald Spengler slash civilizational cycles on your What Voltist bingo cards. And what happened then was that the Romans, who had all the same issues as us today, including inequality, political polar empire that they held reluctantly. Both the American and the Roman empires were so reluctant that they actually invaded people in order to maintain them. What happened was that the Gracchi brothers were wealthy tycoons. This is really funny because a lot of people on the left are like, oh yeah, the Gracchis are like early socialists. And then what about this? Like, no nah, man, these guys are the true right-wingers. Was losing due to competition with slave labor from outside Italy. And they wanted to basically make Rome great again. That <laughs> Man, okay, I tried to invalidate the Gracchis through saying that they were trying to make themselves dictators, take them off the ballot, and then they assassinated the Gracchis. But what happened after this was Rome spiraled into its civil wars which killed the Republic. The Gracchi brothers were Roman politicians and reformers who positioned themselves in opposition to the Senate. They weren't outsiders, though, by any means, having the backing of nobles who had backed their father, who was a successful politician. In that way, they are quite alike Donald Trump, who is often portrayed as an outsider despite very much belonging to the same class as those he sometimes rhetorically opposes. The reason for the agrarian land reform initiative that would eventually end up leading to the murder of the Gracchi was not because middle-class laborers were outcompeted by slave labor, but because land had begun to accumulate in the hands of wealthy landowners who possessed a lot of slaves. This large, unsupervised slave population meant Rome was threatened by slave revolts. One occurred in Sicily and had to be crushed with the use of regular troops of the Roman military. Another reason for the land reform was that the so-called Roman middle class was essential to the maintenance of the Roman military. And Tiberius Gracchus alleged in this propaganda that the best soldiers came from the farmers. According to him, restoring the economic base of the farmers would revitalize the Roman military. The proposed solution to the problem of too much accumulation of wealth and power in the hands of a few was for the state to expropriate some land from the established owners and redistribute it. I don't know if Donald Trump has proposed anything of that sort. Tiberius Gracchus was a tribune of the plebs, an elected official in the Popular Assembly of Rome, which was meant as a check on the Senate's powers. There were multiple tribunes at various times in Rome's history. I'm not quite sure how many there were at the time of the Gracchi, but I believe there were two. While Tiberius was attempting to push through his land reform to elevate his political status and address perceived problems in the Republic, his rival and fellow tribune Marcus Octavius, at the behest of the Senate, vetoed the bill. So Gracchus did the unprecedented thing of having the assembly call a vote to depose and eject his rival Octavius. Klaus Bringman described this as a revolutionary step and something that threatened the very fabric of the political order of the Republic. Quote, It is hard to avoid the impression that in the course of these disputes, the Tribune developed from the tool of an influential faction into the charismatic leader of a popular movement who ignored objections and was prepared to burn his bridges and either win or go down fighting. Following this, Tiberius Gracchus attempted to stand for another period in office, which wasn't necessarily illegal, but it was also not explicitly allowed in the unwritten constitution of Rome. His opponents interpreted this as an attempt to seize power, and so he was bludgeoned to death by his opponents, the senators. His brother Gaius would face a similar fate as he took up the work of the now-dead Tiberius Gracchus. Gaius sought to maintain a majority in the popular assembly by connecting political beneficiaries to himself, rendering people his clients, essentially. You scratch my back, I scratch your back. Among his controversial legislations was the grain law that provided a subsidized grain ration to the urban population of Rome, which the Senate interpreted as him binding the urban citizens to himself. Gaius sought re-election, but unlike his brother, was not murdered, until the third time at least. 
After Gaius Gracchus had also been murdered, many of his reforms were kept in place, like the grain subsidy. The Senate was perfectly fine with stomaching the expenses. What they feared was Gaius's populist appeal. Now, what what Voltes conveniently doesn't mention is that Julius Caesar, who in practice destroyed the Republic, was also a populist, and not an outsider to the aristocracy. I'm not that versed in ancient history, though in my reading and from what I recall of the university course to which this book I've been using was assigned, I believe it's uncontroversial to interpret the Gracchi as laying the foundations for the disintegration of the traditional Republican political order, not bringing it about. What Voltist compares the Gracchi brothers to Donald Trump, and believes that the 2024 election just months away will spark a civil war. In the Roman example, the ensuing civil war, Sulla's civil war, began in 83 BCE. Gaius Gracchus was murdered 38 years before that by the Senate, in 121 BCE. Even if Waterfaultist is right in the parallel to the Roman Republic, I think the disintegration of the American Republic would be a gradual one, and not something so dramatic. Many political developments have occurred in the last 2000 years since the fall of the Roman Republic. The rise of new economic classes and new class struggles. Developments have changed the nature of political participation. Technological changes have drastically altered the dynamics of recent revolutions from past revolutions. It's possible that historians of the future will draw continuities between the events in past American history and future history we have yet to see. Continuities that extend through a gradual disintegration of the American Republic all the way towards a second civil war. It's even possible Donald Trump will feature prominently in such a narrative. But I personally don't think what of Altist is right, in that the narrative of the collapse ends anywhere near November 5th, 2024. I don't think there's any harm in preparing for political upheaval, so long as you're not obsessive about it, or let it adversely affect your life. Though these events are to come to pass, you are going to be better off forming meaningful connections to people around you. And, in the interim, instead of organizing towards a worse future, organize towards a better one. Sometime it will appear normal. You'll still have to wake up in the morning, eat breakfast, and do your job. Past a certain point, peace will feel strange. Do you remember a time when New York City hadn't been burnt down? I've what? been predicting America- What? Is that how he ends it? Uh, check out War Thunder for free on PC, PlayStation, and Xbox by clicking the link in the description or the pinned comment. And claim your limited time bonus pack available to new and returning players who haven't played for at least six months, for a limited time only. What Voltist ended his video in a very strange way, so to match that energy, here's me holding my phone with my mouth, filming myself peeling a sweet potato. Thank you to the patrons who support this channel. Special thanks to patrons Jordan M, Lebo, Monday's Last Brain Cell, Ritanger, and Vichire? Vichar? I hope I, I hope I didn't butcher that. If you'd like to see your name in the video, see videos early, read the messy scripts I make, and so on, check out the Patreon link.